everybody. This is your old lonesome and left behind in Live Oak, Pro Arms Podcast host Steve Denny welcoming you to Pro Arms Podcast number 54. The next installment, if you will, in our sort of ongoing series about interviews with real world gunfight survivors, real world gunfighters, if you will. And this one's going to be Jeff Hall, who is now a retired lieutenant from the Alaska State Troopers. Anyway, uh, aside from being a internationally known trainer, uh, very much in demand as a speaker, instructor at the various law enforcement training conferences, uh, probably Jeff in that venue is best known for his program called Finish the Fight. Jeff Hall from the Alaska State Troopers and his experience from back in the 1980s in Manly Hot Springs, Alaska. Take it away, Mass and Jeff. Hey gang, Mass Ayub here for Pro Arms Podcast. As you know in the past, we've given you basically the story from the heart from the people who participated in some of the most memorable gunfights. Uh, Bill Allard, Andy Brown. With us tonight is one of the few men I've met in 36 years of law enforcement that I would consider a super cop. And I say that not just because I think of it that way, because I've been on the air turf and the men and women around them who have worked with them for a lifetime felt the same. His name is Jeff Hall. He comes to us retired safely, thank God, from Alaska State Troopers. In 1984, Jeff was involved in a cataclysmic shootout with a serial murderer who was highly skilled. Jeff's partner was killed beside him, and Jeff, God bless him, brought justice about two seconds later. It's our privilege tonight to talk with Jeff Hall, late of the Alaska State Patrol. Jeff, welcome to Pro Arms Podcast. Thank you, Moss. I appreciate it. Could you give us a little bit of your background, uh, particularly coming up prior to uh, the incident in Manly Hot Springs in 1984? I, uh, like, like a lot of people, I grew up uh, with firearms. Uh, my father was a retired uh, Army Command Sergeant Major. Um, I started shooting... Uh, 1911s and Colt Aces when I was four. That would be hmm, sometime before 1960. Um, I've been a, been a firearms uh, shooter uh, most of my life. I was an instructor for the Alaska State Troopers. I uh, spent four years in the Army myself. I joined the Troopers in uh, 1978. I was stationed in Anchorage. Uh, did two years in a remote uh, one-man bush post. Then I transferred to Fairbanks in October of 1981 and uh, joined the CERT team, a special emergency response team. And uh, team membership was based on a, a variety of figures. It's unlike, uh, it's unlike SWAT selection today where there's psychological tests and interviews and a lot of stuff. It was mostly by, uh, in those days, by skill with firearms and reputation in the organization. And uh, I'd been on the CERT team there for uh, about two years when the uh, shooting in Manly occurred. How old were you then? Uh, 32, I think. About 32 years old. Okay. Tell us about Silka's rampage and how you were brought into it and what those terrible logistics were that took you so long to get there. Well, there's a quote by von Clausewitz in his book On War, and it says, amateurs discuss tactics and professionals discuss logistics. And uh, it's especially true in Alaska. Uh, when I was a, in a bush post, I had 58,000 square miles where I was the only peace officer. I would travel four or five days uh, in, in, a, in a circuit, either by boat in the summer or snow machine in the winter, to visit the villages. Uh, in an emergency, when there was a shooting or something, I would charter an airplane and fly down there. So it's not a question of jumping in a patrol car with a three or four minute response. It's taken me, in some cases, days to get to a homicide scene uh, because it was 50 below zero with a 50 knot wind, chill factor of 80 or 100 below, and there is no traveling. So the thing that everybody has to understand about uh, 
policing in Alaska, especially for the troopers, and more specifically for SWAT, is that um, if you go someplace, you have to have a fighting load to resolve the immediate conflict problem, and you have to have a subsistence load that is going to be able to keep you for days without resupply, food, water, shelter, uh, clothing, ammunition, everything that you might need. So uh, it it's typically it takes quite a bit of stuff to, uh, to get you there to solve the, the problem that's presented. Um, Michael Silka was a, uh, a loner, a drifter. In Alaska, we call them end of the roaders because they drive to the last place a vehicle can go and that's where they stop. And they're, the FBI called Silka a, a simple schizophrenic. They're just people that may be sociopathic. They, the only thing that matters is how things affect them. There's a, a line in Alaska, there's no laws for the brave ones and there are no asylums for the crazy ones. And uh, there, there certainly is an element of people that, uh, that go there just because it is lightly policed. And there's a lot of uh, sentiment in Alaska of uh, you leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. So Silka, we believe, killed a man in North Dakota. Sometime, he was from a suburb of Chicago. He was driving a, a, a Dodge Monaco four-door sedan. He had a canoe tied to the roof. Uh, we believe he killed two women in Alberta. Um, and there were two individuals seen in his car about two days before the shooting at Manly. Uh, that we've never been able to account for. Prior to the, the shooting at Manly, Silka lived in an area uh, east of downtown Fairbanks called Hopkinsville. And it's pretty common in the Fairbanks area. They have what they call dry cabins. <clears throat> Pardon me. That's a small uh, log or frame cabin that has no running water and no plumbing. Uh, they have electricity usually, um, but as we talk now in the January of 2010, a cabin like that rents for about $800 a month. And there was a cluster of these cabins out on this Chena Hot Spring, or excuse me, uh, Chena Pump Road, and Silka was living in one of the cabins. Silka was stealing firewood from an old woman that was living in another cabin. And another neighbor named Roger Culp uh, confronted Silka um, about stealing firewood from the, uh, from the elderly woman. And there was some kind of a conflict and Silka killed Culp. Probably carried his body uh, across the main road um, out onto the river ice of the uh, Chena River and dropped his body through a hole in the ice. Culp's body was never found. Several days after the homicide, someone called the troopers and said, uh, we have a missing guy named Culp. Last we knew he was going to see this weird guy, Silka, that lives in a cabin uh, and no one's seen him since. So a Fish and Wildlife Trooper and a, and a regular uh, uh, patrol trooper uh, went out to Silka's cabin. And Silka never fully opened the door. He, the only part the troopers could see was his head and his left arm. His right arm was behind the door. And he produced identification. Um, the troopers asked if they could go inside. And he said, no, I'd rather you didn't. They had no probable cause to enter, no exigent circumstances. But they saw a pool of blood laying in the snow. And the trooper asked, what about the blood? And there was a piece of a moose hide hanging in a tree there. And Silka said, uh, a guy I know gave me a moose quarter, and that's moose blood. And the Fish and Wildlife trooper took an empty film canister and scooped up some of the blood and snow, and they left. Unlike what you see in uh, CSI today, it takes more than eight minutes to get a DNA sample <laughs> or uh, blood typing. So they shipped the blood off to the lab and about a month later it came back that uh, moose don't have type O positive blood. So uh, more troopers went out there and by that time Silka was long gone. And he had loaded his vehicle and driven up to Manly Hot Springs. Manly Hot Springs is about 150 miles north and slightly west of Fairbanks. Uh, it's on the banks of the Tanana River. And Silka had gone there and gone to Manly driven through the village and down to the bank of the river. And the Tanana River flows past. The Tanana is a, a, a tributary of the Yukon. So we're north and west of Fairbanks. And Silka moved down to the boat landing. It, it's not a boat landing like you're thinking of in Texas where it's all paved and you go down to it. It's just a place where the bank is low enough that people can put boats in and out. And there was an old cannery there from the early 1900s 
It was also a place where people, it was sort of the town dump, where people would take appliances and cars that didn't work, and it was sort of if you need a generator for a, you know, 1965 Chevy truck, just go take it. It was sort of a, a real casual thing. And there were some old buildings and, and lots of old cars and stuff there. And Silka set up camp there, and, um, you know, even by Bush Alaska standards, he was pretty strange. He carried a large uh, buck sheath knife, and people would see him uh, dancing in the air and slashing his knife around, and, and uh, thought he was a little bit strange. And what we believe happened is on May 17th, uh, there was an individual in town, and some of the names escaped me, but I believe his name was Majeska, and he was known to be a really irritating aggressive, confrontational individual. And Majeska was accompanied by another man whose name escapes me. And there was some sort of a confrontation with Silka. And from piecing together from other interviews with people who had talked to Silka, he, he told everybody, I'm going to go in the mountains and be a mountain man and live off the land. And, and the people who had lived in Bush, Alaska for a long time know how difficult that is. You can't take a can of chili and a, and a pocket knife and a roll of visqueen and go live off the land in Alaska. A lot of people try that and uh, end up being rescued by the troopers. It takes a great deal of infrastructure and supplies and a tremendous amount of ability and stamina uh, to be able to do that. And there are some people who do it successfully, but they're rare. So we think what happened is Silka told everybody what he's going to do and Majeska said, uh, you don't have what it takes and there was some kind of a confrontation and Silka shot Majeska through the eye with a 44 Magnum. The other guy, we think, started to run away and Silka shot him. Both bodies were dragged and thrown into the Tanana River. Sometime during this process, a man named Lyman Klein, his wife Joyce, who was six months pregnant, and their two-year-old boy, Marshall, came riding up on a Honda three-wheeler. Silka shot all three. He's disposing of their bodies when a sixth guy uh, came down, and, and again, I apologize, I don't remember his name, and Silka killed him as well. So he's disposed of all these bodies. On May 18th, someone mentioned that to uh, a guy named Bob Lee. Bob Lee had been a former trooper and was kind of the town mayor, and he ran the Roadhouse, which is a hotel, bar, restaurant. And Bob Lee and another guy drove down to the uh, boat landing, and the canoe was gone off Silka's car, the four-wheeler, or excuse me, the three-wheeler was still parked there. Um, they could see some blood spots and some drag marks. So Bob went back to, uh, to the hotel. They don't have regular telephones. He had a radio telephone and called and uh, said that there were some people missing in Manly. There was an unusual guy who'd been there. And he gave the license number for the Dodge Monaco. The call came into the trooper dispatch in Fairbanks through through uh, Alaska Telecom. They didn't speak directly with Bob Lee. They ran the license plate and found a locate in connection with the missing Roger Culp from the earlier homicide uh, at Hopkinsville. And it was kind of unusual for the troopers because the typical response would have been uh, Trooper Hall, take Trooper Duncan, take the Suburban and drive up to Manly and see what's happening up there. But the, the lead homicide investigator had been the CERT team leader for a number of years named Sam Bernard. And Sam said, uh, you know, maybe we should send some CERT guys up there. So Friday night, May 18th, 10 o'clock, pager goes off. Uh, we have a CERT call out. Um, so I grabbed my gear, jumped in the car, drove down, and we decided that we would take three of us in, uh, in a fixed wing airplane, uh, along with the CERT team commander, uh, Lieutenant John Myers, and uh, fly out to Manly and see what we could do. So it was about 3 o'clock in the morning when we landed uh, on the airfield at Manly. It's a grass airstrip, it's unlighted, but by May and, and at 3 o'clock in the morning in Alaska, it's starting to get pretty light. And we, uh, we talked about where we were going, what we were doing. Dave Hamilton, one of the other troopers, uh, Dave's a former Marine, uh, maybe the best shot that I know. Dave had been there, he had been a rural outpost trooper, and Tana, or Manly had been one of the villages that he patrolled. So he knew the way, so we decided we were going to walk the three miles down. So Dave took point, and I was point slack, uh, Lieutenant Myers was number three, and uh, Trooper Troy Duncan was the rear guard. And we patrolled down there nice and slowly down the road in the ranger files, a uh, good interval between us, um, not knowing where or what 
uh, where he was or what he was doing. And we had no real description of him except the crazy guy that was living in his car at, at the boat landing. And as we patrolled up uh, close to the place, we, uh, we saw his vehicle. The canoe was gone, and we had been told that he had a canoe on the roof of it for some time. So we had about a two-hour operation to try to clear all the abandoned buildings, clear his vehicle, clear all the wrecked cars, and do a, do a static search of that area to try to see if he was still there. And by then it's about five or six in the morning, and uh, we've gotten a lot more light, so we can see some shell casings, uh, some blood stains, the drag marks, and uh, although none of us were homicide detectives, we figured something had probably happened. Um, two of us secured the scene, Lieutenant Myers and uh, I don't remember what, I don't remember if it was Trooper Duncan, I drove back, to, or uh, went back to Manly and um, called, they asked for a more cert, uh, investigations, um, helicopters, all the assets that we thought we'd need to conduct the search. And our only clue was that man, that uh, Silka had a 17-foot aluminum Grumman square-end canoe with a uh, outboard motor. And I, I don't recall the exact time frame, but by, by early morning, 9 o'clock or so, um, Trooper Duncan, Lieutenant Myers, and I are flying search patterns. Trooper Hamilton, uh, Trooper Devin Carr, got in the second helicopter and what we're doing is flying the rivers. There are eight or ten smaller rivers um, in there that feed into the Tanana. And there's a river called the Zitziana, the locals call it the Zit River, that leads, it flows from south to north and its headwaters are up near the western side of Denali National Park. Um, there's a large lake up there, Lake Minchumina, there's some homesteads up there. And Silka had mentioned that his plan was to go up the Zit River and uh, be a trapper in the Lake Minchuman area. One of the problems that we had was the black bear season had just opened and there were a lot of people out hunting black bears. So what we had to do was stop on every camp we saw, every boat we saw, every tent we saw to try to see if it was Silka. I remember specifically one, uh, we, we, land, we flew over it, turned around, landed a couple of hundred yards away. Uh, Trooper Duncan, who was a former Marine captain, a Vietnam combat veteran, uh, fine, fine rifleman, he and I were doing a bounding overwatch as we come up toward the, uh, toward the tent, and Trooper Duncan laid down behind a, a log. Um, Troy was armed with a Colt AR-15 with a three-power scope, and I was armed with an M16A1 uh, without a scope. And the, uh, the hunter that was there was standing there looking at the helicopter and I uh, I was behind a tree and identified myself and uh, uh, told him that uh, we needed to talk to him, you know, to keep his hands up and all the rest of that. So he came up and determined he was not the person we wanted. And he said, uh, boy, you know, when I'm out in the woods I don't carry binoculars and normally I look through things through my rifle scope, but something told me I probably shouldn't do that to that helicopter. And of course, Trooper Duncan would have shot him had he done so. So that was one of those little uh, side parts of the of the drama that was, you know, uh, it just wasn't that man's turn to go. So we got back in the helicopter and we kept flying, and we we searched until about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. And by that time, we had uh, six or seven fixed wing aircraft. We had the second helicopter. Uh, we had search teams flying everywhere. So Lieutenant Meyer made the, the uh, decision that the four of us would go back to the roadhouse, um, get some rack time, catch some sleep, and uh, pick it up a little bit later. So about, uh, um, and I remember this distinctly, I'm, I'm laying in bed, uh, I've got my 1911 in my hand uh, while I'm laying there sleeping. The door flies open and I came up out of the bed and pointed my pistol at the door and it was a trooper with really wide eyes when, uh, when he told me that they thought they had uh, spotted Silka. Now Silka had been going up the, uh, the Zit River and there was a trapper named Fred Burke that was coming down the river. Um, Silka killed Burke uh, and took his boat and gasoline. So now Silka has killed um, at least uh, eight people. We, um, got, we developed a quick plan. Uh, we had two helicopters. The plan was we would take off the uh, left side doors of the helicopter, 
We'd, we'd all hook in to, uh, to a hard point on the helicopter. We all had repelling harnesses and a piece of nylon. So we clipped into the hard point. So we're, we're sitting with our backs to the, to the interior of the helicopter facing outboard. And um, the plan was, and of course a plan is just a list of things that isn't going to happen. Our plan was we're going to fly up the river until we see Silka. And the first helicopter, actually the second helicopter is going to fly past him and put Dave Hamilton with a sniper rifle on the ground. And Dave was armed with a Steyr SSG 308 with a, with a six power uh, telescope. And then the plan would be that with Dave on the ground, two helicopters in the air, that Silka would have to face us in three separate directions from a moving boat. And to the everlasting credit of uh, Lieutenant Myers, and, and you know, pardon the, the, the graphic language, but I, I think it's indicative of, of, of the mindset that went on, and it's a tribute to, uh, to Lieutenant Myers. The uh, operational order was, okay, if the cocksucker does anything except put his hands in the air, kill him. And Lieutenant Myers, um, to his everlasting credit, uh, told the grand jury, told the internal investigation, yeah, that's exactly what I told my men to do. Which, in this age of political correctness and people who are more interested in their career than in doing the right thing is a testament. So anyway, we took off in the helicopters. You know, things don't happen according to plan. We spotted another camp. The second helicopter dropped off. Um, Troy and I had both, uh, I had loaded two magazines with, two 20-round Colt magazines with tracers. And as we went along, Troy and I both uh, chambered around and fired a couple of rounds down into, the, into a sandbar just to function test the guns. And I was, we were, I, like I said, I had an M16, Troy had an AR-15. Uh, we each had a revolver. Um, we were required to carry a Model 19. Troy had a Browning High Power 9mm. I had a Colt 45 1911. Uh, in those days, we didn't have uh, flashbangs or NFDs. Uh, we didn't carry gas. Um, we, pardon me, we didn't have that. Dave, the, the, with the sniper rifle, didn't have a backup weapon like a submachine gun or an M4. So as we came by, the second helicopter containing the sniper dropped off. So we continued flying on and we saw the riverboat that belonged to Fred Burke with a canoe tied behind it. And Silka had pulled into a little slough off the, uh, the main Zit River. And there was a tree across it that he couldn't go any further. And so he tied off to that. And uh, I've, been, uh, I've been in this business a long time, and, and uh, I, I've seen a lot of violence in my past, and I'm just a firm believer in destiny. And uh, the gods of fate made that, that the only landing zone within a couple of miles was a gravel bar directly in front of the position where the boat was tied. Um, Everything else, the, the nearest other one was four or five miles away. We'd had to land the helicopters, try to hump cross country uh, by compass to try to find this location. So additionally, Lieutenant Myers was in the second helicopter. Troy and I were in the first helicopter. The detachment commander, Captain Don Lawrence, um, had taken a seat in the rear of the helicopter. Captain Lawrence was armed with a 45 Colt. And the, some people criticized the captain for being there but uh, the captain said, if anybody's going to get shot at, it'll be me. Again, and that's a testament to leadership, which is sadly lacking in American law enforcement today. As we flew past, we, could, we looked down, and it was down to our left. We were probably only up about 100, 150 feet. And we could see someone in the boat. At this point, we still hadn't identified that it was Silka. We had a pretty good idea it was because of the canoe. And we saw him reach down and bend over to pick something up. We had flown past and turn to land upwind. A helicopter is like any other airplane and landing into the wind is more efficient. They can do it without it, but it's not the way you fly an airplane. The pilot was Tom Davis. Tom was a two-tour Vietnam combat helicopter pilot. And as we started to come down into the LZ, you know when a helicopter begins to land and gets in ground effect, it's almost motionless. And as we started to come in and Tom started to flare the helicopter, I could see over to the end of the LZ and there was a drop off with a river bank and we couldn't see anything except the position, the approximate position where we had last seen Silka. And um, in fact you and I were talking earlier today Moss about 
hinky, what hinky means and you know how we articulate mm -hmm. that or fail to articulate it. But it looked like a bad LZ to me. I'd, I'd been in a lot of bad LZs in the past. And I yelled at Tom, get us up, get us up, get us up. And Tom started trading kerosene for horsepower and the nose of the helicopter dropped a little bit. Tail came up and we started to fly forward. About that time, a couple of things happened simultaneously. And as we're sitting here in this, uh, this nice room, um, I can see it as vividly as if it happened this morning. There were three little birch trees uh, that were kind of in a, a triangle that sort of all grew together at the base. And from beneath those, those three uh, birch trees, I saw Silka step out, and as he turned toward us and started to swing his rifle, I watched the sunlight uh, glisten off the varnish on the stock. Um, Silka was shooting a Ruger number no. one single shot falling block rifle in 30 out six with a four powered Weaver. Oh, let me go back to the very beginning <clears throat> when we met at headquarters and we're, um, we're getting briefed on the operation. And again, pardon the graphic language, but it, it, it's important when you think about our mindset as we went out there. So I'm asking the, uh, the uh, investigator, I said, so is this a, is this a tough guy? Is this an ex-seal? Uh, what is this? No, he's just some fuck from Chicago. So it, we'll get to the lessons we learned out of it, but it's important that what we were thinking when we went out there. We're not, we're not chasing John Rambo, we're just chasing some guy from a suburb of Chicago. We found out later that Silka had, a, uh, had trained himself and he would hold two rifle cartridges in his mouth with the primer facing back uh, toward his mouth. And he had honed the, the sides of the falling block action on the rifle. And we found out later from witnesses that with a single shot rifle, he would shoot it, keep the butt in his pocket, would flip the falling block action down, ejecting the round, reach into his mouth with his uh, support hand, feed another round in, close the action. And shooting a single shot uh, rifle, he could keep a tin can bouncing it on. Now, when you say kept the rifle in the pocket, you meant the pocket between the deltoid muscle and the uh, pectoral muscle. That's correct. The shoulder. That's correct. So he was a phenomenal shot. So Silka turned up, Troy fired, I fired, and Silka fired all at the same time. And we all missed. I, I was, uh, saw the tracers go down and hit into the sand at his feet. And anyone who's been in a, in a gunfight understands about um, audio exclusion and how, how time and space are distorted and the strange things that go through your mind. So I see this red thing burning there and I said, this fuck's got a campfire going. Totally irrelevant to anything that's going on, but it was just what stuck in my head. Silka fired his second shot and hit Troy in the neck with a 180 grain 30-06 round. My second burst, I, I saw that I had hit low and left on the first burst. Uh, so I adjusted up, fired the second burst, and uh, hit him eight times. Um, hit him in the lower leg, through the thigh, through the pelvis, a couple of body shots, and two shots that went through his head. I felt and heard the bolt lock back. It makes that distinctive boing sound when it happens. Um, I reached up, punched out the magazine. I watched it fall in slow motion to the ground. 1995, we, the three of us went back out there and I found the magazine, we still have it. Um, I put in another magazine, uh, hit the bolt release and I leaned out of the helicopter. And by that time we had flown past him and I could see that he had fallen over backwards and the rope that was tied to the, to the boat was stuck behind his legs and his head and shoulders were underwater. About that time the captain said, break off, break off, we've got a metal, medical emergency. Um, the round that had hit Troy had gone through his neck and hit Captain Lawrence in the side of the head. Um, the captain was, had minor injuries. It was mostly uh, fragmentation from the jacket. Uh, but uh, I realized then that all the red stuff that I was seeing inside the helicopter was Troy. So we went back to, uh, we, we started back to Manly. The helicopter needed fuel before we could fly into Fairbanks. So we're flying back to Manly and uh, the second helicopter, now there was a Super Cub, uh, a little two-seat Piper Super Cub that was circling up at about 5,000 feet. And anyone who's been in a situation knows that the, the communication net just gets jammed by everybody that wants to talk. So everybody's trying to talk and the two fish and wildlife troopers in the Cub are saying they're shooting at each other and we're saying we've got a medical emergency. The second helicopter is saying what's going on. No one's communicating with anybody. 
which is, I think, pretty typical of most police operations there for a period of time. So Troy, or excuse me, Troy is dead, Cabin's wounded, uh, my soul is scarred. We're flying back to Manly. Dave Hamilton, a trooper named uh, Craig McDonald, and Dave Hamilton now have to land in this presumably hot LZ and resolve the rest of this problem, and they have no information to go on. So, and this is something we hadn't really practiced. Dave steps out at a range of about 25 yards with a rifle with a six power scope. Dave throws it in the brush and pulls out his model 686, excuse me, his model 19 revolver. Like I said, Dave is one of the finest shots I know, and uh, Lieutenant uh, Trooper McDonald stayed back and was c providing kind of an overwatch position. Trooper McDonald, or Lieutenant Meyer started laying down suppressing fire, and Hamilton ran as fast as he could toward Silco's last known position. Hamilton, former Marine infantryman, dives on the ground. Um, uh, Lieutenant Myers reloads and starts firing again. Dave comes running up to the edge of the bank and comes over the bank with his uh, revolver in his hand and sees that Silk is upside down in the water. And he yells at Myers. Myers comes running up. They make a real cautious approach and uh, finds out that uh, everything on the back of Silk's head from the years back is gone. One of the rounds that hit him through the forehead and, uh, and blown backwards. So we had flown down to uh, Manly and uh, we're, we're on the ground there, and shortly after that, uh, the, uh, the second helicopter landed. As I'm standing there, um, you know, trying to take all this in, anybody who's been in combat understands the, the, the exhilaration and the depression, uh, you know, the adrenaline highs and lows, um, all the rest of that stuff. And um, Troy sitting in the backseat of the helicopter, and a photographer came running up. He had three or four cameras around his neck, some morbidly obese guy from one of the local papers with his camera. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm gonna take a picture. So this photographer came running up the helicopter and we had a brief, uh, very direct conversation about whether he was gonna take pictures of my dead comrade or not. And he opted that he probably thought that wasn't gonna be a very good idea at that particular time. And I agreed with that, so he decided he would take pictures at another time. So we, uh, that was about the conclusion of the incident. Later on, we, we had, of course, our debrief and criminal investigation and all the rest of it. And then, uh, then we had to try to figure out the lessons that we had learned from it. Tell us about those lessons, Jeff. Uh, the first and most important is don't underestimate your opponent. Um, you, you know, uh, Troy and I were both, uh, both veterans, uh, um, good military backgrounds. Um, we're, in a, we're in a helicopter, we have machine guns, we're even dressed in black and have Gore-Tex and, uh, and Velcro all over us. So, you know, we're the aces from the base, we're the high-speed, low-drag guys. And Silka just wasn't impressed. Um, Silka attacked us. He attacked two armed men in a helicopter with the expectation that he was going to win. Um, and I, you know, we, as we're doing these in law enforcement, we start planning our raids and everything. Ooh, this is a bad guy. He's a, you know, he's a biker uh, hit man, or he's a whatever he is. He's a, you know, uh, Iraqi war special ops guy that's killed 10,000 people. And so we take that guy seriously. And then um, if it's somebody else who's just some, uh, well, we don't take that guy particularly serious. And, and I, my thing that I always tell the students is your most dangerous opponent is the next one. I don't care if he's a 15-year-old with a single shot 22 or uh, you know, a 10th degree black belt with a machine gun. The most important, the most dangerous opponent is the next one. And uh, I, I, I don't want to try to inflict paranoia on anybody, but I want everybody to have an understanding of being as totally prepared as you can be. And I was physically prepared. I was in great condition. I was uh, training and teaching karate. Uh, I was shooting all the time, uh, but I was mentally unprepared because I, I underestimated his drive and his desire and his dedication and his capability. And um, I think there are so many people out there who, you know, if you, if you go out into Montana or Idaho and you're chasing some guy who hunts elk every year and he's got his seven millimeter magnum, he's an extremely formidable opponent. We, we all have a tendency to think that you have to have some sort of special training and, and all the rest of that. All you have to do is be willing and be reasonably capable. 
And there are so many people out there who are just physically and mentally tough that we totally underestimate. Um, and those are the people that are going to kill us. Those are the people, because everybody else, we're ready for it when we go there. We have everything from, you know, the National Guard to helicopters to armored vehicles. So we're ready for that person, anticipating it. So it's never underestimate your opponent. Um, the second is you have to be willing. If you'll, if you'll allow me to quote John Bernard Books, I found out early on that most men, regardless of cause or need, will hesitate before they pull a trigger. They'll blink an eye or draw a breath, and I won't. And I think that's an important thing for us to understand is it's not a desire, it's not a, I don't want to shoot anybody. But if destiny puts me in that position, I won't hesitate to do that. Um, I didn't hesitate uh, when it was time to shoot at Silka. As soon as I saw the gun swing up, I started shooting and I missed. Um, even though I, hit all, I got almost 50% hits from a moving helicopter at a guy, which is a, is a pretty good average, had I hit him on the first burst, uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I think a, a certain amount of skill um, and, a, and a great, great um, knowledge that you are willing to do it. And you know, if you read Colonel Grossman's and, and all of the rest of the literature that's out there, you'll find that most of us aren't willing um, for whatever reason, religious, moral, philosophical, uh, whatever the reason is, we aren't willing to take another human life. I was sitting next to a guy on the airplane down there, we're having a conversation, and he says, well, don't you feel bad about that? No, I don't. Uh, I feel good about it. I mean, I did a service to the state of Alaska um, and I, I have no remorse at all. Um, and and um, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I, I think um, physical preparedness. Um, I was a good shot, I was in good condition. Um, I, as I look around a lot of the police officers today, they're not in the physical shape that they should be in. And so many of them are not dedicated to self-improvement. Um, I hear it all the time. Well, if the department wanted me to do X, they would pay me to do it. Guys, I'm sorry, the department doesn't care. Um, if you want, and I don't want, I, I never use the word surviving confrontation because you can survive in a wheelchair. If you're blowing into a little tube to make it stop and go, you lost. And I don't care what Mrs. Smith told you in the second grade, we're not all winners, Bobby. And just because you made the football team doesn't mean you get a trophy. The winner is the one who walks away when the brass stops tinkling. Everybody else is a loser, and our guys have to win. And I'm not saying that we're remorseless, that we kill people, that we assassinate people. I'm just saying that when up jumps the devil, um, we have a job to do quickly, efficiently, professionally. Um, as Clint Smith said, some people just need to be shot. And if we're in that position, then that's our duty and obligation to be the ones that do the shooting. Jeff, you're recognized widely throughout Alaska as a hero cop. The other cops I talk to, private citizens I talk to who are into this in Alaska, tell me that if someone says, name a famous cop from Alaska, the name is going to be Jeff Hall. You destroyed this sort of creature that I've come to call the archetype of the beast. And in, what was it, two seconds of sustained gunfire? You know, it takes about 1.3 seconds to run out a magazine on full automatic. I think probably um, 25 rounds were fired in two seconds, two and a half seconds. Two men killed and one wounded, which is a, a pretty intense nanosecond in the time of the universe. Yeah, I think 25 rounds, two to two and a half seconds. And uh, actually pretty effective fire on, on all sides. Well, one of your best friends, Troy Duncan, a man that you have honored ever since for his sacrifice and his courage that day, died of a horrendous explosive gunshot wound to the brain that literally splattered his body tissue all over you. That's correct. Tell our listeners what it's like to deal with that all these years later. There's always an element of survivor's guilt. I can rationalize it, and Silka had been a crewman uh, on a military helicopter at Fort uh, Wainwright. And the logical part of my brain says that Silka shot Troy because Troy 
was sitting where the door gunner sits on a military configuration aircraft. And now, what one of you was to the front on that side, and one to the I rear. was the front left. Troy was in the rear. And that's the logical part of my brain. The other part of my brain said, it, it's just destiny. Um, I'm not a religious man. Um, I hope I'm a spiritual man. I don't think God cares what we call him. And please, for all of those of you out here that are, that are members of, of some religious order, uh, don't witness to me. Uh, I appreciate the sincerity of it. Um, but I, I think it's a matter of destiny. Um, I've had five friends in my life. Uh, three have, been, have died violently, uh, and two are nervous. Um, and I, I, one friend, Troy was one, another one was killed in Southeast Asia. Um, another one was survived 27 years with the troopers and died in a plane crash. Um, personally won four gunfights. I just, I just think that uh, the God or the gods or fates write your name on a piece of paper with a date and a time and there's nothing we can do about it. I feel, I feel guilt that I'm alive uh, and Troy's dead. I feel nothing but contempt for Silka. And I think anybody who loses a partner, loses a friend like that, uh, has some survivor's guilt. But the spiritual side of me said, you know, it wasn't my turn and, uh, and it was Troy's. So, You've dedicated your life, particularly since you've retired from the State Patrol, to teaching others how to survive these things. Uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your career as, as it evolved into a trainer of other troopers, and then beyond that into a trainer of law enforcement and law enforcement and private citizens now nationwide? Yeah, I can. Um, I, was, uh, I became actively involved in traditional martial arts when I, when I moved to Fairbanks. And I started training under a grandmaster named uh, Charles Scott. All martial arts are good. It doesn't, there's no one that's particularly any better than another, and it depends on you individually. And Charles Scott was one of those individuals that was the right person at the right time in the right place. Again, it was destiny uh, that put me in his dojo. Um, since then, I've had the opportunity to train with uh, Soke Takeyuki Kubota, uh, Soke Mark Shui, some of the best uh, martial artists in the world, uh, Shihan Rod Kuratomi from uh, the International Karate Association, and all of these people have been able to help my physical, mental, and spiritual development. In addition, um, one of the things that after Manly was I realized I had a I had to train harder. I had to be in better shape, better mental condition, a better shot, a faster shot. Um, I have spent untold thousands of dollars, untold amounts of my own time, seeking out masters of weapon craft, uh, Clint Smith, uh, Chuck Taylor, Louis Auerbach, Scott Reitz from ITTS in LA, people who have in Colonel Cooper's words, seen the elephant. I was just at gunsight less than a year ago going through a shotgun course from Bill Murphy, a SWAT officer from Huntington Beach who's shot half a dozen guys in combat. And I, if I'm going to spend my own time and money, um, I spend my money on people like that who, who in, again, in Cooper's words, have seen the elephant. And from every single one of those people, I have taken away something that makes me a better teacher um, and makes me a better fighter myself. Uh, I had one person tell me that I was a hero, and uh, I really hate that word, um, because a hero acts out of selflessness toward his fellow man. I acted to save my country butt and my comrades butt. So when you do that, there's nothing heroic about it. You're doing your duty, and it's a self-preservation thing. So had I done something selfless, then that's fine, but I didn't. It was strictly self-preservation. I became dedicated to not only making myself better, but others better. I trained with Soke Kubota in the Kubaton, the PR-24. I've, I've since then, uh, I have uh, upper belts in uh, karate, and jiu-jitsu, kobudo, and I try to pass these things on to my students. I have a lecture that I called Finish the Fight, which is a treatise on the proper role of aggression in conflict. And during the course of this lecture, it's about a four-hour lecture, we look at videotapes of police officers being shot 
And the overriding thing is they are either calling for help or trying to go to cover. And no one that I know can outrun a bullet. Soke Kubota might be able to make himself not there anymore, but I'm not sure of that. And no help can get there fast enough to save you. If, if you are standing at confrontational range with any other human being and you're both armed, you have to finish the fight first. You have to deliver accurate small arms fire into that guy until he is no longer a threat. And you've been through the course a couple of times, I know, Moss. Um, and I think I go back to uh, Pierce Brooks, officer down code three, and we use too little force too late. We are afraid of the repercussions of using force. Or um, as just happened in Twin Falls, Idaho, the homicide suspect who had just shot his estranged wife's boyfriend with a handgun, when the police officer stopped him, he stepped out with a gun in his hand and the officer tried to taser him. So I think we are responding with too low levels of force in too many cases. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't advocate we go out and shoot people for no reason. But when it's time to shoot, in the words of John Bernard Books, you have to be willing. Jeff, you mentioned earlier the, the terrible track that the killer left behind him before you and Troy faced him that day. And essentially, he was murdering helpless victims. You, you told our listeners how long it took there for a police response to arrive. And even in metropolitan cities, the saying is that when death is seconds away, the police will help you are minutes away. Since leaving the Alaska State Patrol, you've worked for the National Rifle Association. Could you tell our listeners briefly what your take is as a retired career cop and gunfight survivor on the importance of law-abiding private citizens being able to protect themselves with a lethal force level? There's no question that every citizen has the right, uh, should have the ability, uh, should have the opportunity. I testified as an expert witness in a case in Alaska where a preacher, it, it's kind of a long story, uh, was forced to shoot and kill two burglars. And the, the state's position was he should have waited for the troopers. On several prior burglaries, he had called and asked the, uh, you know, called for a trooper, a burglary, and sometimes it took hours or days for the troopers to respond. In that case, his wife called the troopers said, my husband just confronted two burglars. I think he shot and killed someone. It was 46 minutes before the first trooper arrived on scene, knowing that there had been a shooting and someone was dead. Superman, Spider-Man, Flash cannot get there fast enough to help you if you are faced with a lethal confrontation. In a three minute response, some of the people that you and I worked with over this last couple of days in shooting, uh, in three minutes could wreak unbelievable havoc on, a, on an unarmed group of people. There are tremendously competent, qualified uh, people out there um, who have no remorse, who have no compunction about, about doing you harm. If you value your wife, your children, uh, your family, I never advocate using lethal force to defend property. That's why I have insurance. But I'm afraid that what I'm seeing so much today is there is such a, a lack of, I, I don't quite know the word, there's such a lack of uh, feeling among some of, the, some of the goblins that are out there that they will kill you regardless. I mean, how many cases do you know of where they killed someone just to see what it felt like? So I think, um, I think the, the Second Amendment is absolute. I think, and this is my position, not the NRAs necessarily. I think that every citizen of the United States um, has the right to own a firearm of his or her choice in order to protect themselves. Once, once so equipped, they should seek out quality training. There, as you and I know, there are a lot of charlatans in this business. There are a lot of people who are unqualified to do so. Gunsight, ITTS, Lethal Force Institute, some of the places out there uh, that have top quality professional instructors who can teach them how to use force, teach them when and when not to use force, but when the time comes to use force quickly and efficiently and effectively. Uh, I cannot say enough that, that I, think, uh, I think everyone should have a firearm. Everyone should know how to use a firearm. 
I'm just writing a book called The Survival Shotgun about uh, the shotgun as a survival weapon for just this type of situation. If you look at Haiti right now, the lack of food, the rioting, the things that are going on, Katrina. Um, in a matter of four days, New Orleans went from Katrina to a third world city with rioting and looters and snipers and all sorts of things going on. So it doesn't take very much and I think that um, if you have a family and if you value yourself that uh, it's absolutely imperative that you be armed. Jeff, a few moments ago you spoke about the clergyman who had to use deadly force to protect himself and those within the mantle of his protection. You spoke for him, as I understand, as an expert witness. Tell our listeners what the jury responded to. The jury responded to, to a number of things. There was a tremendous size disparity. Uh, the preacher was a smaller man, a little bit older, in poor condition. Uh, both of the burglars were six foot tall, 200 pound uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. The jury felt in, in about uh, 45 minutes that the use of force was justified. One of the issues that, hap that came up was one burglar was shot front to back and the other was shot back to front. And I relied on the research of uh, Dr. Marvin Fackler who published a piece about why police shoot people in the back to talk about reaction time and lag time. Uh, and it's certainly explainable, justifiable. And I explained to the jury that this was an absolute justifiable use of force on the part of this armed citizen. And I don't think there is a tendency to try to hold a citizen to the same standard as a law enforcement officer. Um, but fortunately, most jurors in the United States have common sense and they're willing to look at this um, from a reasonable man standard, not necessarily what would a policeman do, what would you or I do, what would a trained martial artist do, what would the normal guy at three o'clock in the morning do? And I think that's really important that we look at. So the result was an acquittal. It correct? was an acquittal, that's correct. God bless you for doing that, Jeff. And for all of us at Pro Arms, thank you for taking the time tonight to share your story and your valuable lessons with our listeners. We're looking forward to having you back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ott. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, man, we really appreciate all of the people who are willing to share these types of incidents. and and we really appreciate him taking the time to sit down and talk with Mass and share all of his thoughts and his experience with us. So thank you, Jeff, for taking the time. Thank you, Mass, for the excellent interview. And we hope you all enjoyed it. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye. 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 Pro Arms Podcast music is by Kevin McLeod.